This podcast is brought to you by Kiefer Her. Whether you're feeling the effects of menopause or your menstrual cycle, discover what's key for you in less than five minutes with tailored supplement recommendations, information and insights on kieferher.com. Hi, I'm Renee. And I'm Donna. Welcome to the Key For Her podcast. In this series, we aim to educate and open up honest conversations with both medical professionals and real life women. We want to shine a light on those topics that sometimes go unspoken about and help empower women to know what is key for their health and well-being. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of the Key For Her podcast. My name is Dr. Kiva Hartley and I am the resident doctor on the Key For Her podcast. Over the coming episodes, I will be speaking with a variety of medical professionals from different specialties and about a range of women's health topics. Today's guest is Dr. Michael Crotty. Michael trained as a GP and has specialized his practice to weight management and bariatric medicine. He is the co-founder and clinical lead of the My Best Weight Clinic in Blackrock, Dublin. He is a member of the National Clinic Clinical Advisory Group on Obesity and is a regular speaker at international conferences. He's passionate about educating medical professionals on this topic and is a fierce advocate for patients living with obesity. He did ask me to include that he was awarded first place in the national membership exams for general practice. And I can divulge here that although Mick has dreadful taste in music, thankfully he has better taste when it comes to wives. So Michael and I are married 10 years actually next week, which is a... Uh, astonishing to I think both of us I can't believe it's been 10 years but um anyway so Michael thank you for coming on the podcast um and we're here to talk about a really important topic um maybe a good place to start would be if you could talk to us about why this is such an important topic why it's something that people are talking about at the moment and where you know things like stigma and that kind of thing where, where that all comes from Absolutely, yeah, and thanks very much for having me. Um, that's officially the nicest you've been to me in 10 years <laughs> since we got married, so great to get such a, a wonderful introduction. Yeah, I think, you know, this is an incredibly important topic. It's something that uh, is talked about a lot in society, in social media, uh, on TV, radio, everywhere, and I think really the way we talk about weight is... Um, maybe not the best way to talk about weight. Um, a lot of people who are living with overweight or obesity, they are judged um, because of their weight. There's assumptions made about them. There's assumptions made about their diet, their lifestyle, their physical activity, you know, and, and lots of other things. And this, this is wrong. Um, there's a lot of stigma and bias out there um, because of weight. <clears throat> when we understand the, the science and the biology underlying weight, we know that this is not a issue with willpower. It's not an issue with motivation. This is actually a much more complicated topic. Our weight is not within our control as much as we would like to think. So, you know, most people that I meet, you know, despite, you know, focusing on healthy eating, despite being as physically active as they can be, um, they still struggle with weight. And, and this is the problem. They often will blame themselves and they're picking up the, all these messages in society, in the media, that they're doing something wrong or they just need to find the right diet. We know that kind of dieting and diet culture can actually be very, very negative, you know, towards people. It can set up very unhealthy, unsustainable weight control practices. It can have physical and psychological negative impact on people. So really, I think we need to change the conversation away from the blame and shame that's happening at the moment to a conversation around supporting people, to a conversation around health. Because really, weight and health are related topics, but they're different. And health is the vital thing. If somebody is living with excess weight, and that weight is having a negative impact on their health, then this is a medical issue, it's a health problem. Uh, rather than focusing on the numbers on the scales or size or, uh, you know, these other, I suppose, more superficial markers, we should be focusing on the impact it's having on health. Many of my patients are living in a bigger body and they don't have diabetes, they don't have blood pressure, they don't have cholesterol or arthritis or all these medical problems that can be associated 
associated with weight. Uh, but for them, it might have an impact on their confidence, their self-esteem, their psychological well-being, their joints, you know, their their exercise capacity, you know. So it is having an impact on their on their life. Uh, but maybe they don't have medical complications. So what you're saying is that weight is not just the number on the scales or kind of how we might medically define it, but more that it's to do with the impact it's having on someone's well-being, their health, their sense of self, like a much more broader way of defining it. And you often talk about weight as a chronic, or obesity, I suppose, as, as a chronic disease. So talk me through a little bit about why that is the case and how you define a disease and, and, and the sort of science behind that a little bit. Then. Yeah, I think, again, to me, it comes back to health. You know, previously in the past, we used to define the chronic disease of obesity based on body mass index, which is just a measure of our size versus our, our height. Where did that come um, from? It, it actually came from a statistician in Belgium like a couple of hundred years ago. It, it wasn't designed to, to be a marker of Can you name that health. statistician? I cannot no. name the statistician, <laughs> okay. but uh, if you give me my phone, I'll be able to Google it for you. But With that's the, something like when we were in college... Hmm. I remember that's how things would have been taught to us is that you always look at someone's BMI. It was all about BMI. Mm. You record their BMI. Do you think that's not as important a parameter? Is it something that we should be? Absolutely. On <clears throat> on an individual basis, body mass index doesn't tell us much about health. It's not a great reflector of health. It's a measure of size on the planet. It doesn't tell us about body composition. It doesn't tell us about muscle mass. It doesn't tell us very much about health at all. In population-based studies, when we're looking at a country and we look at body mass index, it can give us an indicator you know, of size in the population. And it, it has some value in scientific studies when we're looking at large groups of people. But on an individual basis, it, it doesn't, doesn't tell, tell you us about very health. much. So right. you can have somebody okay. who has a body mass index that is maybe slightly above kind of the recommended range, and they can have many, many kind of health problems associated with weight. You can have somebody else who has you know, a much higher body mass index who has no health problems related to weight so basing our diagnosis on size is the way we used to do things but really we're moving away from that we're now moving towards this idea that you know the the current definition we use for the chronic disease of obesity is excess or atypical adipose tissue or fatty tissue that impairs health so What's it comes down adipose to adipose tissue then is so is is fat cells is fatty tissue so <clears throat> if we have excess or abnormal fatty tissue and that's having a negative impact on our health then this is a medical problem and when I think about health, I think immediately our brain goes to cholesterol, blood pressure, you know, heart disease, diabetes. We can't ignore kind of psychological health and well-being. We can't ignore our functional, physical, mechanical health, our joints, our ability to do the things we want to do, to, you know, go out and, and travel and not be concerned about, you know, a, an airplane seat or the seating that's available or the, the world we live in. Because really, society in the world is thin-centric. It's, you know, it's driven to, by and towards uh, people who are living in smaller bodies. So, you know, that again feeds into the bias and the stigma around being a bigger person. And I presume, that, is there evidence out there to suggest that the population, globe, well, not maybe not globally, but certainly in the modern, modern world is probably the wrong thing to say, the population in the Western world is, in the developed world, is is getting larger that like the body size is ten is trending towards yeah absolutely so yeah. that's not so, a myth it is something so that's <clears throat> body size is increasing uh, and you know as a result of that some people who are living in a bigger body will have that negative impact on health and if those people have a negative impact on health then it's a medical issue for them we know that the last kind of accurate data we have is from 2015 and in 2015 60 percent of the irish population are living with overweight or obesity 60 60 percent okay at that stage it was postulated that by 2030 it would be 90 percent of the Irish adult population so that's uh, Irish people above the age of 15. In so 2030 so in another like less than 10 years. Exactly now we don't have any updated data yet but this is an ever-increasing problem and really to me this is this is the part I find fascinating because we talk about weight we talk about health uh, we talk about why people struggle with weight but you know the reasons for that are, are really what interests me. You know, we know that, um, you know, there's many different factors that lead people to struggle with weight. We know that our genetics plays a huge role. So weight is something that can run in families. There are hundreds and thousands of different genes that have been identified that code for our risk of whether we're going to have an issue with weight over the course of our life. Those genes predominantly code for what's going on in subconscious kind of caveman, cavewoman parts of our brain. 
parts Talk of to our me brain about that the, we can't control. Is it the is it the polar bear? What was the thing you were telling me previously about? So so essentially, you know, when I'm talking to my patients, I talk about the idea that humans evolved to survive when food was scarce. Okay, it's not natural um, for us to lose weight. There's no other animal on this planet that goes on a diet. You don't see cows, pigs, or chickens going on diets. No caveman ever went to, you know, a slimming club or went on a diet. That we know of. That we know of. Right. Okay, now yeah. maybe they had, you know, inside the caves, <laughs> they could find some, some paintings with kind of measurements, but no. Um, generally, you know, humans evolved and animals evolved to survive, and we have to survive when there's no good supply of food. And most of human history, there hasn't been reliable food sources. Sources. So all of our biology, all of our physiology is created to, to maintain our weight. So within our brain, if we think about this kind of caveman, this kind of you know subconscious part of our brain, an area called the hypothalamus, and that is responsible for regulating many of our body functions. It regulates our temperature, but it also regulates our levels of hunger and fullness. There's another area near that called the limbic system that re- regulates kind of our reward from food. So the chemical response, the reaction, the dopamine, the pleasure hormones we get from food. So is that why when you're feeling low or you're having a stressful day and then you maybe eat something really nice and you get that sort of boost of like, oh, I feel good now. Absolutely, yeah. And well, I kind of want that again. And then you eat some more like is it yeah and uh, for some people that that can be an issue so when I talk to people I talk about this kind of this appetite system and again this is going on you know under our conscious level under the radar we may not be aware of it happening it's it's happening kind of within our body so we know from studies that uh, people who are living in a bigger body um, whose weight is higher levels of hunger hormones are higher Okay, so already they are they are dealing with higher levels of hunger. So they're, these are hormones in your brain that make you feel. So they're they're hormones that are produced kind of in our body. So the pancreas, our stomach, uh, our muscle mass, our fat mass is producing these hormones that are communicating with the brain, and the brain is picking up these kind of hunger and and fullness cues from our body that and make constant, you want to eat. Yeah, there's constant feedback going on. So our our body and our our stomach is telling our brain whether or not we should be hungry, whether we should be full. And by definition, when somebody has, has, is struggling with their weight, when they're living in a bigger body, there's a dysregulation of that appetite system. Hunger hormones are higher than our body requires. Fullness hormones are lower. So, you know, really when I talk to people, I, I talk about the fact that, you know, we're all trying to play the same game, but everybody is given a different set of rules. It's not a level playing field. You know, you're not dealing with the same hunger system that I'm dealing with. You have inherited uh, an appetite system and your own levels of hunger and fullness. My appetite system is different. You know, so so generally I might be kind of subconsciously thinking about food more. I might be more driven towards food. I might be hungrier more. I might eat more and be less satisfied when you take the exact same amount of food. So this is why over the course of our lifetime, if my body is biologically more driven towards food, I'm at higher risk of taking in more than I need. So... Okay, so if we're sitting down, we're watching TV in the evening and I have a cup of tea and you have a cup of tea, what you're saying is potentially the voice in my head versus the voice in your head, there are different volumes telling yeah. us I want something to go up my tea or I want to, you know, I want to... Yeah, so I, I think this this is happening constantly in our body. So so again, I suppose the way I kind of chat to people about it is, is the same part of the brain that regulates our hunger and our fullness and our drive towards food regulates our temperature. You know, so if I go out in the middle of winter and I, I forgot my coat and, and you forgot to nag me and tell me to bring my coat with me. Uh, and Excuse I'm, me, do I ever uh, nag? Uh, rarely, rarely, <laughs> you know, but uh, generally if I go out and I'm cold, I can't think myself hotter or colder because that's a stupid idea. You couldn't, you couldn't change your temperature by thinking because that's not within our control. But yet, people are trying to think themselves less hungry, think themselves more full. It's not possible. This is happening at levels of our brain that we can't control. And that's why it's <clears> not willpower is because 100%. it's driven by hormones yeah. yeah and what's interesting and we talk about this a lot at home I mean we're marvelous dinner guests obviously because our conversation is just so interesting we're sitting at home talking about hormones and whatever but like there's there's so much crossover between a lot of women's health and in particular menopause I think and what you're saying about 
the chronic disease of obesity because it, like you mentioned the hypothalamus this part of your brain that actually regulates it does regulate our temperature it's part of our kind of our thermoregulatory zone and we know with fluctuating hormones with menopause that thermoregulatory zone becomes much more sensitive and it's part of what drives hot flushes and night sweats I knew I knew you'd find some way to bring this back to menopause it all comes, it back, all to comes back to menopause, menopause. It, does. it all comes back but to I'm women's supposed health. to be yeah. the special guest here talking about my <laughs> stuff and it has to be all about Kiva but you're, in you're in my house now Rick you're in my house now um but there is there's so much crossover isn't it and really like I think it's really interesting to know that an awful lot of like we know women who get worse hot flushes and worse night sweats and worse menopausal symptoms often that's genetic it's predetermined it's not in their control we're not expecting them to you know think away their hot flushes um and same idea like so much of it comes down to the hormonal regulation that's actually happening mm. in your head that you don't have control over and, and yet we are conditioned you know if, if you're struggling more if you've got a more severe issue that's your fault that's your responsibility you know you're doing something so wrong where does that come from do you think that Again, blame it's... that we have that stigma that sort of impression that if you're struggling with weight it's not anything to do with genetics and biology mm. it is clearly to do with lifestyle and willpower mm. where does that come from that's Answer me that. Yeah. Answer me that. Well, you put me on the spot. But I, like I can, I think you can, you know, this goes very deep, you know, in society, particularly if we're talking about weight, you know, weight is, you know, the aesthetic, the the idea of beauty, the idea of control, the idea of, you know, the, the deadly sins, gluttony and, uh, and sloth and laziness. And there's all these associations that, you know, well, if you struggle with weight, you must be kind of um, eating too much and not getting exercise. You're sitting at home, you're eating shite and you're, you're, you're not moving, which couldn't be further from, from the case like 99% of the patients that I meet they are very focused on healthy eating they're being as physically active as they can be and they're still struggling with weight but yet they'll blame themselves because they look at somebody else who's you know whose diet may not be as good but doesn't have an issue with weight and it's, it's utterly not fair and that's what I'm saying this is not a level playing field so people that I meet you know despite kind of you know being absolutely diligent about what they're doing they're still struggling with weight and that's why we have to kind of bring it back to talking about why this isn't within our control. You can take 100 people and you can put them on the same calorie deficit and you can see 100 different responses because everybody's body is different. Our physiology, our genetics, our experiences, you know, the things our body have been through are different. And certainly when it comes to weight, I think all you need to do is, is turn on the TV or social media. It's so weight centric. It's so very much kind of, you know, we need to be this size where that came from I don't know I'm sure you know um, diet culture and uh, you know it's a multi-billion dollar kind of industry kind of selling people weight loss and you know the idea of health and you'll be healthy and you'll be happier and you'll be stronger if you're you know, skinnier if you're skinnier and, yeah. and whether this is a, an evolutionary thing that we're kind of you know again subconsciously looking at each other and finding a mate or I don't know where it's come from but it's absolutely ingrained from the moment we're born this idea of thinness is good and like Again, it's, it's the case of if we bring it back to health, which is the most important thing, there are people who are, you know, by body mass index in a normal category uh, and they might have lots of medical issues. They may not have good levels of fitness. There because are they're people, not active or their exactly. diet's not great, but because of genetics, 100%. that doesn't manifest yeah. as an issue with their weight. And there are other people then who are much bigger people who are very fit, very healthy, not on any medications, but yet they're told and they, they you know, uh, every time they go to the doctor, no matter what problem problem they go to you know the GP or, or the consultant they see will find some way of blaming it on weight or oh, if you just lost weight that would get better so I think to me it's very very nuanced because you know we know that health and weight are related concepts we know that you know if somebody is bigger and um, you know they don't have medical issues statistically long term there are certain medical conditions that we're at higher risk of but it's not a foregone conclusion that we're going to have these problems so again as to in me, not everybody who's overweight is going to get diabetes exactly right exactly. So, so I think, you know, the old fashioned kind of, you go to the doctor and the doctor tries to scare the living daylights out of you, you know, if you don't lose weight, you're going to get diabetes, you're going to die, kind of this, you know, catastrophizing. Like, that's a big problem. And again, it's to educate doctors and healthcare professionals about how we should be talking about weight, how we should be non-judgmental, because this is not people's fault. And that's one of the first thing I tell people is, you know, somebody struggling with weight, it's not their fault. This is biological. It's genetically conferred, it's centered in the brain, it's regulated by hormones, and we haven't even touched on the world we live in. And you mentioned about the polar bear, which is my, my little chestnut uh, that I talk to people about. You know, the idea that a polar bear lives in 
factories, I don't know where they live, the Antarctic or wherever <laughs> they live, and they're exquisitely designed to survive in very inhospitable surroundings. So it's Baltic cold, there's a lack of food. Their whole biology, their physiology, the color of their skin, their fur, everything is designed to survive in the Antarctic. You take a polar bear, you lift them up and you plonk them down the middle of the Sahara Desert. All of a sudden, all those things that were of benefit that protected him in one environment now are his worst enemy in the Sahara Desert. So really, I talk to people about humans evolved to survive when food is scarce. It's not natural or normal to lose weight. We are exquisitely kind of evolved, you know, for that purpose. And that protected us in human evolution. But, but we now, now live in an environment where there's food absolutely. readily available. It's often high calorie, mm. etc. Yeah. And so, so but we live we're, over and above food. We live in an environment where levels of stress, our sleep, our physical activity, uh, you know, medications that somebody might be on, uh, smoking and stopping smoking, uh, menopause, pregnancy, you know, uh, hyper uh, uh, portioned, you know, calorie dense, ultra processed foods that, that don't exist in nature. So can I ask, when you talk to patients mm. and you give them this, you know, I don't song, want to say, song and dance. Song and dance. And you do your little routine, your little yeah. tap dance. But when you go through, look, this is how I explain it. This is the science behind it. Do you, is it, do they believe you? Yeah. Do they struggle to believe you, do you well, think? I'm very believable. No, I've I know. Had, you're I've, very convincing. Well, you convince me. So, um, but like, do they, do they buy it? Do you think? Or is it so ingrained, this constant narrative? Weight gain is your fault. You are doing something wrong. You just need to change something with your lifestyle. Eat mm. less, move more. So, do, I think, I think is it hard to convince people? Look, I'm telling you, this is the science and it's... I, th- I think, you know, the, that brings up a lot of good kind of issues because Thank people you. come in and they have... You're very good at that. Uh, <laughs> people come in and they have preconceived ideas. Uh, I'm, I'm considering having one of these kind of, you know, ultra modern kind of word boards or kind of idea what boards. What is a word board, it's a Michael? thing where you put kind of ideas and quotes on a wall. How do you know what um, a word board is? I read some of your magazines. So <laughs> I don't have any in, magazines. <laughs> when, when people come in, invariably they'll say, you know, what's the best diet? What weight should I be? Because again, this is the idea they have of kind of, you know, there's there's that magic diet that's going to sort it out for me. Is it going to be keto? Is it going to be intermittent fasting? Is, is it there paleo? one, like, do you recommend? There is, no, there is no one diet that has ever been shown to be more effective for weight control long term than any other. Uh, and we'll put a massive big pin in that because that, that brings up another topic that we'll kind of come back to. But, but people are convinced, you know, this is going to be the answer. This is the cure. This is the magic bullet. And no such thing exists. This is much more complicated than that. People come in and invariably, invariably they say, you know, I know what to do. I just need to do it. And they have this idea because they've, they're very often, the people I meet, have often lost weight and huge amounts of weight before, but that weight tends to come back. You know, I meet people and they've lost tremendous amounts of weight over the course of their life, but their weight has cycled and they've yo-yoed and it's been up and down. So they think, you know, I've done it before, I can just do it again. And this this time it will be different. This time it will work. So they're ingrained with that kind of belief about, you know, I have the stuff to do it. I just need to apply myself. You know, I just need more more willpower. Um, but, but again, when we talk about the science, when we talk about the biology, when we talk about the reasons why people struggle, people get it. You know, these, these people are highly intelligent, highly driven people. You are know, they skeptical though? Because it's... Initially, initially they're skeptical more from the pa- fact of I have a lot of people come into me and they feel the first thing they need to do is convince me that they eat healthy and convince me that they exercise. And I tell them, I stop them in their tracks and I say, I know you do. Like this, this that's not the issue. You do know, you think they have a history of maybe talking to medical professionals who don't believe them when they say, I'm not at yeah. home with a really unhealthy diet. I'm not, you know. Yeah. Now, again, it's a case of most people come in the, you know, and they do have a healthy diet. It's not to say we couldn't all improve our, our diet or our lifestyle, but that's that's not the issue for most people. So people come in and they're kind of telling me this and they've, they're have they used to being blamed and shamed. They're used to being judged and they do have that kind of defense up. So immediately when I'm talking to them and saying, look, I know this is not your fault. doesn't mean we don't have a responsibility to address it, but it's not your fault. You know, if somebody comes into me as a GP and they've got asthma, I don't say you, you stop think coughing. Just, you know, it's just, your fault. Just yeah. stop coughing. You know, yeah. to my mind, and I tell people, you know, telling somebody who's got an issue with their weight to simply eat less and move more, like how insulting is that? As if they've never thought of that. Like, yeah. oh geez, oh, I actually never thought about. Or you often say it's like telling someone who's depressed to just cheer up. It's yeah, a gross like, oversimplification, 100%. and it puts all the responsibility on the person when it's actually biology at play. Yeah, exactly, and you, you'd, you'd you'd never do that for other medical issues, but yet for weight, we do. Healthcare professionals do it all the time. This podcast is brought to you by our very own brand, Key for Her. 
Whether you're feeling the effects of menopause or your menstrual cycle, discover what's key for you in less than five minutes with tailored supplement recommendations, information and insights on keyforher.com. Please have 20% off on us by using the promo code KEYPODCAST in all capitals. You were talking there about people yo-yoing or they lose weight because they restrict their calories. And if you go on a diet, like it's physics, you're, you know, you're going to lose weight. Mm. But regain is often the problem. And I've heard you, because I half listen to you some of the time, and I know you've talked about the biggest loser before. Mm. What's the... Remind me of what the story with that is. So the, we have lots of scientific evidence. And, you know, when we look at the evidence, the biggest loser is one of these kind of car crash TV, voyeuristic, just kind of TV shows that from the States where they get people and literally they starve them half to death and they exercise them within an inch of their life and they lose phenomenal amounts of weight in a short period of time. Makes good TV though, apparently. Absolutely. And, and you know, people love it. It's one of the highest, I think I think they've taken it off the, the air now just because it was so car crash television. But, it, but it's one of these shows that people love watching and again, it, it feeds back into these kind of body transformation before and after photo kind of, you know, if you apply yourself, you can do it, you can lose the weight and you'll be able to keep it off long term. When we look at kind of the studies, we know that 80% or more of people who lose significant amounts of weight will regain all of that weight within a two to five year period. Okay, so just let that sink in that if somebody kind of goes on a diet and they lose weight, long term, that weight will come back in over 80% of people. Okay. okay. And, and that's the lived experience of people I talk to. That's they're, a huge number, isn't they're, it? They're constantly, the majority, losing, yeah. they're constantly losing weight, but then the weight comes back. Yeah. And again, coming back to my old chestnut of biology and physiology, we know why this happens. Again, going back to the hypothalamus, going back to the subconscious brain, going back to the caveman. And I talk about this kind of caveman in the back who's, you know, too hungry, not satisfied, uh, and again, gets more of a reward from food. So he's louder. So my caveman might be louder than yours. If my weight is at a certain level, for whatever reason my, I have gained the weight and for whatever reason my weight is where it is, that's where my brain and my body considers normal. That's where I should be according to my brain. So your heaviest weight is where you're so it may not necessarily be your heaviest weight but it's the weight you've spent kind of some time at outside of pregnancy because establishes some sort of line in your brain like, of like, like i'm a, happy with like that. a set point like a like a thermostat i kind right. of talk about this thermostat in the brain and it's set at our higher weight you know now that set point kind of varies from person to person yeah. and it's probably more a range of weight but a lot of people will find that you know they go on a diet and no matter what they do the weight comes back and it'll go back to kind of this certain level so if what about we, pregnancy though Mick? so pregnancy is a different physiological time why is um, that i don't know i don't, I don't know, know. Either, yeah. much smarter people than me i'm sure could could explain They're it not to you, me but, i'm afraid no. but so basically you kind of discount pregnancy doesn't count is what yeah. you're saying so, I suppose so, it isn't the same type of weight gain it's now, different now again like, it's a case of kind of you know after pregnancy there are other challenges like women have to put up with lots more kind of as far as you know, lack of sleep husbands, stress annoying yeah. husbands who are useless at home you know all these kind of things that that you know are other risk factors for gaining weight yeah. and pregnancy for f some women this this is you know again i sometimes listen to you about your menopause mm -hmm. spiel as well Good to know. And, you yeah. know we know that it can be very variable and and it's it's different person to person weight is the same for some people i talk to you know pregnancy can be a trigger for weight gain but for weight some, gain i suppose in pregnancy isn't just you're not gaining adipose tissue a lot of the time exactly. you're gaining this you know vascular weight like you're gaining yeah. blood but, flow you're gaining again, baby you, placenta and amniotic fluid if you, and, if you also think about it you know and again how many women you know maybe pregnancy is the first time in their life that they haven't been on a diet because they've been dieting from you know teenage years there can the, be huge relief you know, with that so, i think that it's the first time you sort of give in to these changes that are happening in your body and it's kind yeah, of I, I think i suppose give in you know makes it sound like kind of the floodgates are opening but, well, because but I they're think just a lot not of, kind of trying to restrict I think for, for teenage girls in particular, although maybe it's the same for teenage boys, but I've never been a teenage boy, so I don't know, but you tell me. But like, I think the changes that happen through puberty are really disconcerting. All of a sudden, your shape changes, you have boobs. Well, I didn't, but some girls do have boobs. and But things like, obviously things change. And then in pregnancy, you go through this like huge change in your body again, totally out of your control. You wake up every morning, you're sort of living in a different body. It's really weird it's lovely in some ways it's challenging in others and then with menopause actually something similar really happens I'm bringing it back to menopause again I'm like um but same idea that your body shape changes mm. the way I mean you talk about how the weight gain at menopause changes and I think is there some is some of this maybe to do with control as well that like this a lot of 
you know, as your body changes through puberty, through pregnancy, through menopause, we've no control over any of that. And that can be disconcerting. It can be horrible at times. Yeah. And maybe dieting and that kind of striving for a particular body type there's a sense of control over that that you're like I have control over my body I'm limiting my calories I'm controlling what's happening mm. and there's kind of deep psychology with that you're looking at me like I'm going mad now no I, I just think you know all of that is going on in people's head you know every single day and this is why it's such a complicated area and again underlying all of that is the biology and the biology then is is throwing a spanner in the works, you know. So again, you're 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 absolutely wanting me not to talk about this caveman that I keep coming Sorry. back to. <laughs> Tell and, me and, about the caveman. And, so, but but again, I think it's really important. And the one thing that I actually try and get across to everybody is sharing an understanding with people why over the course of life they have lost weight and regained it again. And again, the idea of this thermostat, the idea of this set point in our subconscious brain that our body is defending. So really, if my weight is at a certain level and I'm a caveman and there's no food or I'm a modern man and I go to Slimming World or, or a diet club, then, you know, my weight comes down, okay? In response to intentional weight loss, the rules of the game in my body change. My biology adjusts. The pitch becomes more tilted against me, okay? So those hunger hormones that for genetic reasons or other reasons are too high already get increased more. The fullness hormones that are already too low, uh, so I, that I don't feel satisfied, get reduced further. The reward pathways, the, the pleasure hormones, the dopamine, the good stuff that we get after eating <laughs> and other stuff, uh, those that gets hyperactivated. So again, we get more of a chemical reaction in our brain, more of a pleasure response from food. So all of a sudden, in response to losing weight, I am now biologically hungrier, I am less satisfied by food, and I get more of a craving, a wanting, a reward from food. Like, you know, people will talk to me, they'll say, you know, and, and I've, I've experienced it myself, where, you know, at the evening time, I'm not hungry, I just had my dinner, but I'm standing at the fridge, I'm looking in, I want something, I you're need something. You're a picker, something. I think, aren't well, you? It's, like... it's a case of you're kind of standing, you want something, you need it, and, and kind of one isn't enough, and, and then I had two, and then you say, oh, feck it, like, you know, it's, it's yeah, that today is gone anyway, I'm going to write it off, and, and then kind of the, that control you you talk about kind of is gone and then it's the all or nothing black and white thinking that we all have as know, in I've I'm already on on sort of opened the box I might as well just exactly well today is a write-off I'll start again tomorrow or you know it's Thursday you couldn't start on a diet on a Thursday because that's that's ridiculous you have to start on a Monday or it's the 28th of the month only a lunatic would start something on the 28th let's let's start on the first of the month all this kind of permission thoughts black and white thinking we have going on in our brain which allows the kind of the subconscious kind of messaging and biology when it reaches kind of the smart lad who's driving the bus up the front to, to make decisions that guy then takes his eye off the road he kind of takes his foot off the pedal he's like, oh here look I'll start again on, on Monday and again people are constantly this is happening but you know like I said in response to losing weight you know it becomes more difficult so I'm hungrier I'm less satisfied I get more of a chemical response from food so it's not that I'm running out of willpower. It's not that the diet stops working. It's not that I fall off the wagon. It's that my biology is changing. And that encourages my weight back up. And the real bugger of the situation is we get back to the weight we were before and the system doesn't reset. So we're now back at my original weight before I went in the diet, before I got on the merry-go-round, but my biology is more driven towards food. I'm now hungrier, I'm less satisfied, and I get more of a reward from food. So naturally, most people, the weight goes up a little bit more. And then that becomes the new normal and the thermostat in the brain only goes in one direction. And so presumably that comes that's up to meet. like demoralizing then oh, 100%. as well. And so that makes the mountain even steeper to climb. Yeah. So, so this is the constant kind of weight cycling, yo-yoing. So people are losing weight and lots of it. And then the weight comes back and they go higher. And again, the, the internalization and the blame and shame they have of, you know, I've done it again and, you know, this has happened. And then, you know, January comes and we all get a health kick or summer comes and, you know, we refocus again and we do it again. We're repeating the same experiment over and over again. Or some people, it might be that we're, you know, driven towards a particular goal. So let's say I'm going on holidays or I'm getting married and I want to kind of you know lose weight for that and then we get to that and that's almost like an end point and we can say okay we breathe out we relax because oftentimes these things we're doing to try and control our weight they're unsustainable mm. they're not enjoyable mm. they're very restrictive and very often very unhealthy so these weight controlled practices you know and again you just have to go into social media and you see the 
absolute garbage that's out there. We're being sold, this is the cure, this is the secret your doctor hasn't told you about kind of type thing. Uh, and, and we're sold that this, this is the new answer. And that's not the case. This is just infinitely more complicated. And that's why we say, you know, I bring it back again to the, what we mentioned at the start. This is a chronic progressive medical issue. This is not our fault. This is not willpower. It's not motivation. This is a medical issue. It's a disease. How much of childhood behavior and what you, like how you eat as a child, like your, the environment you grow up in, if you see your parents cook, that all that, how much has that got to kind of play in any of this, do you think? I think all of these things have a role. If we had a kind of a a mind map or a kind of a list of the things that influence weight. We've gone from a word board to a mind map. Yeah, you see, I'm thinking really laterally here, Keith. I can see that. Wait till I get to redecorate. I'm going to redecorate our house at home. (laughs) Um, but like you'll have a mood board before I do it yeah no, you'll have to tell me about that I don't know what they are <laughs> but again all of these things you know if we looked at the thousands of different things that influence um, our our eating patterns and our behaviors there's lots of different things so again you know you mentioned about kind of the types of food that are available how we think about food if we're looking at our parents our parents are constantly on a diet our parents are constantly trying to restrict and they're giving out to us and we're you know this is this food is good and this is bad or this is good and this is evil the moralization of food no food has any moral value they just have different nutritional composition i remember you saying before because we've three kids in case you didn't already know that i presume you do and um we i was, you know the way you'd be conscious of kind of how you parent and trying to do you're trying to do your best i suppose and when it comes to food i know you're quite conscious of not saying to the kids look if you just finish what's on your plate like finish everything and then you'll get you know insert reward here like the bowl mm. of ice cream or you'll get a treat after dinner or you'll get and to kind of overemphasize well that's a reward like the Mm. food that you get after your meal the treat the dessert whatever that's a reward for finishing what's on your plate and almost ignoring presumably those kind of biological cues you're getting I'm full I don't want to eat anymore my I'm full I'm sated I'm good where I know kind of growing up we'd all have been because our parents were also doing their best and probably would have been telling us to kind of, you know, you've got to finish what's on your plate. Mm. But you think that's the wrong approach. See, I think it's it's a case of, and you can understand as a parent, kind of, you, you understand that like, you know, we we're all terrified that our kids are not getting enough nutrition. You know, we're all terrified that, that our kids are kind of eating healthy. <clears throat> and sometimes that turns into, we're trying to bribe them. We're trying to convince them to take the healthy stuff. And if you just have some of that, that kind of good, healthy, nutritious stuff, then we'll give you a treat. And again, if, if you look at, you know, how do we celebrate every happy event in life? We celebrate it with food. How do we console ourselves if we're kind of sad or, or stressed or angry? We do it with food. And again, it comes back to those reward pathways in the brain and the pleasure hormones. But again, Again, you know, we get these conditioned behaviors that, you know, I know if, if you know, when I was a kid, you know, if uh, something had happened and I fell over and I had a boo-boo on my knee or something, <laughs> and other than getting kisses and everything else, I'd, I'd get a treat and I'd feel better. And I'm again, that laughing because, you know, the story of my mum and the dressing gown and the jelly tots. My mom I think we're in danger here <laughs> sharing a little bit too much on this podcast. Tough. Before, my mom, so my mum is minding um, our twin girls and they were, what age were they, like four or five maybe at the time? And we went over to pick them up on a Sunday morning and my mother came down in her dressing gown and her pockets were literally full of jelly tots. And I think she just spent the whole weekend <laughs> bribing them left, right and centre mm. with like almost kind of Hansel and Gretel style leaving jelly tots all around the house. But it shows you how like everything is, the reward is always inevitably mm a sweet of some description and again it you know as an adult then okay i'm in the middle of a uh, busy i'm at work i'm really stressed middle of the afternoon i get that kind of lull that kind of you know all my energy levels are down and kind of you know have something to eat and Do you have a pocket I, th- full of I think it's the, well you'd be surprised uh, i think it's the kind of it's the sugar that's giving me the rush or the kick or it's a kind of can of uh, you know um uh, a fizzy drink or something like that and again you know Oftentimes that's not physiological. That's just again neurochemistry, and it's it's kind of you know it's it's. What do you mean by neurochemistry? So so again, it's the pleasure hormones that and and chemical reaction we're getting in our brain, but also some of it is placebo. I feel if I take this, I'll feel that I've had more energy. So again, that kind of keeps us going. Or you know maybe it's a case that you know I've I've spent the day, I've rushed out um, of uh, the house in the morning time. I haven't had time for breakfast. I'm working through lunch. By the time the evening time comes, my hunger hormones are going absolutely bananas, and kind of my craving and wanting for food is higher so I'm much more at risk of taking in more than I need so so I think you know we can we can kind of break it down we can we can talk about the biology we can talk about the the experiences that people have over the course of their life maybe you know we know some people if they've been through a trauma some people if they've had issues with mental health some people if they've been on different medications if they've stopped smoking lots of other things kind of influence our weight over time 
So, so again, all of these things have an impact. And then, you know, again, we touched on kind of society and, you know, uh, diet culture and um, the types of food that are available. And, you know, again, coming back to the case of, you know, one of the things that, that people can throw at me is saying, you're, you're saying this is genetic, you're saying this is biology. Why didn't people have a problem 100 years ago, 200 years ago? Well, look at the environment we lived in. Again, it's the, it's the, the polar bear analogy of, you know, our grandparents, I didn't meet some of them, but maybe, you know, oftentimes they would not have the same availability of food and different types of food. They might have gone to school if they went to school or work hungry. You know, they didn't have, you know, jelly tots in their pockets. Exactly. 100%. So, so again, they lived in a different world and they didn't have as much of a problem. They had the same genetics, but this is the complex interplay of genetics, biology, and our environment. Uh, And that's why it's so overwhelming to people. This podcast is brought to you by our very own brand, Key For Her. Whether you're feeling the effects of menopause or your menstrual cycle, discover what's key for you in less than five minutes with tailored supplement recommendations, information and insights on keyforher.com. Please have 20% off on us by using the promo code KEYPODCAST in all capitals. 